economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in Singapore. Now, the focus, of course, is not only on inflation, but it's inflation in the UK. It's climbed faster than expected to the highest in a decade, tightening a squeeze on living standards. And, of course, that's one of the things that we're looking at, living standards, especially for households. Now, that's also putting pressure on the Bank of England to raise interest rates. So let's have a look at what that means for the future and, of course, for BOE moving. Let's bring in Bloomberg's UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden. Lizzie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon for those of us watching from Asia. Surely the BOE has to hike rates in December after the CPI print. Exactly, Francine. Markets will be asking what more the Bank of England needs to persuade it to go in December. CPI came in at 4.2% in October. That's above the economists' expectations. It's the third straight month that it's above the Bank of England's 2% target. It's the highest in 10 years, and it's only expected to keep on rising. Already this week, we've had the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, saying that he's very uneasy about the inflation picture in the UK. He's explained that the reason he didn't vote for for a November rate hike was he wanted to see how the jobs market fared post furlough. Well, we had the labour market data yesterday and if anything they strengthened the case for a December rate hike. So the jobs numbers in December should rubber stamp this argument for a December rate hike and the fear now will be that worries about inflation mean price growth starts fueling itself. So Lizzie, what's actually driving the price surge? Well, natural gas and electricity prices rose last month after the regulator allowed suppliers to hike tariffs uh, to offset the wholesale cost rise. That's expected to happen again in April at the same time as a planned tax rise. So unless the Bank of England steps in soon, this pressure on household finances could undermine the recovery. Lizzie, thanks so much. Our Lizzie Burden there from Bloomberg UK Economy Reporter. Now let's get more on pound calls. I was just looking actually at Sterling and what it was doing on my Bloomberg terminal. This is the power of the Bloomberg terminal. When you're outside, you can have it at your fingertips wherever you are. We're back with Thanos Van Bakidis, global head of G10 Foreign Exchange Strategy at Bank of America. So thank you so much, Thanos, for joining us. When you look at the pound, I don't know whether there was a big Bank of England mistake um, with them talking up the rate increase chances and then not delivering and whether that puts more pressure actually for December. I mean, definitely given the latest inflation data, we believe the Bank of England has to hike in December. But more importantly, they have to get their communication straight. I mean, they've been confusing markets with all this back and forth. Clearly, based on the data, their policies are very loose, so they have to move towards normalization. They have to stop adding fuel to the fire in a way. But it is important to also note that high inflation in the UK has reasons that go beyond the control of the Bank of England. The energy prices, where we believe we have not seen the worst yet, labor market uh, imbalances, that is more the job of the government uh, to address. Now, the pound is somewhere in the middle. If the Bank of England indeed starts hiking, the mm -hmm. pound should be stronger. But it is also affected by all this renewed Brexit uncertainty, the negotiations with the EU, which has created right. a completely different driving theme for sterling. But uh, Thanos, so how much courage does the Bank of England actually need uh, to hike rates in December? Does it make a difference if they wait a couple of months? I think uh, most likely they will have to hike at this uh, point. I think if they are to wait, given the latest data, it will create even more uncertainty. Uh, the Fed is also likely to uh, start preparing the markets for earlier uh, hikes, although uh, next year, not this year. But in the case of the Bank of England, they've been consistently been more balanced in their communication this year. Only recently they've created all this confusion with the back and forth. But there's now clear evidence that they have to start moving. Better to start now and then see how things are going next year, to what extent inflation, some of the inflation might be transitory or not. But if they wait, there is a risk that they may need to move faster down the road and create even a more severe market shock. Mm -hmm. Thanos, thank you so much. Thanos from Bakidis there of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Now we'll have plenty more, of course, from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum here in Singapore. Up next, we speak to Lynn Forster, the Rothschild, Lady of the Rothschild. She's the founder of Inclusive Capital Partners, an investment manager that seeks to improve the ESG performance amongst the companies it invests in. So that conversation is up shortly. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Singapore for the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Now we're joined by Lynn Forrester, the Rothschild, Lady of the Rothschild, who's a founding and managing partner at Inclusive Capital Partners. Now it's an investment manager for the $1.5 billion spring fund, a fund that seeks to improve environmental and societal performance, of course, of its investments through governance. Well, she joins me now. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm happy I to mean, be here. It's so exciting. I remember actually having one of the first interviews on inclusive capital. This was this must have been nine years ago. Yeah. And now look at it and look at how much more we're talking about ESG. What do you need now to make sure that companies invest in the right way and don't just talk the talk? Yeah, you're so right. You're so right. But remember nine years ago, ESG was not even a, a, a term. Yeah. It wasn't a yeah. thing at all. Yeah. And so sometimes I look at progress and I think, oh my goodness, there's too much virtue signaling, there's too much greenwashing. But then I think of the days when people didn't even think about inclusive capitalism and sustainability was something for the NGOs. So I feel right now, post Glasgow, that we have a lot to be thankful for, mm -hmm. but that we also have a lot to do. I mean, Glasgow was necessary, but not sufficient to solve in the climate uh, crisis. One of the great things about this conference is climate is discussed from every single angle, from what should businesses do, what should governments do, what should philanthropies do. And it's going to take a coherent, big effort to move, yeah. no pun intended, the oil tanker. <laughs> but Lynn, are, are we going too slowly? This is, a, I mean, the problem is that we have done a lot right, since nine years ago, since 10 years ago. But if we're going to hit that 1.5 target, we need a common language. We, get, we need a price for carbon. So what are you pushing for, for some of the companies that you, you know, you're invested in? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and as optimistic as I want to be about Glasgow, I mean, we now know that if everything happens out of Glasgow, the experts are saying we're looking at a 2.4. So is 1.5 alive? Yeah not without more work. I believe the most important lever that can be put into place is a price on carbon. Yeah. That if a price on carbon is there. Why don't we have it yet? It's insane. It's politics. And that's such a shame, which is why I'm really calling on as many people of influence as possible to go to the Senate. Right now, in the Senate, the Wyden Amendment is, is being proposed, which would put a $45 price on carbon. And some might say that's not enough, but it's a start. He's one vote away. All we need is one vote, and that's Senator Manchin. And a price on carbon can also be progressive, yeah. because we should have a carbon dividend for working and middle class people because the, the burden of this should go on the wealthy. So instead of a wealth tax, let's talk about a carbon tax. Yeah. And I think that could be so, acceptable. So Lynn, that's really interesting. First of all, you think that's acceptable because I know you, you did a fantastic panel where we also had you know, the president of the AIIB who was saying, look at the Gilets Jaunes in France when President Macron tried to do you know, a lot more. Do you think a tide has turned and actually taxing fuel and taxing some of the fossil fuels in general has just become much more mainstream? I, I think it's much more mainstream, but the narrative has to be handled very carefully. People have to, first of all, understand that they will get checks in the mail to make up for the increase in costs. There will be increased costs, but it should not be borne by the, by the working and middle class. I think that's really important. And then the narrative has to be that by doing this, we are turbocharging the possibility for innovation. Yeah. We're we're going to pay for carbon capture at that point. We're going to go into green hydrogen and blue hydrogen and biomass and all of those things that we might say it would be great for trillions of dollars to be invested in it, but right now they're not economic. So the market doesn't work that way. It'll work that way somewhat and there'll be people who are willing to invest in wind and solar even though the returns are slight, but the massive force of the capital markets cannot work unless there's a price lever. 
But you, so you think actually, let's get a price at, at any cost, even if it's a lower price, because at least we have something and then it readjusts. Yes, I definitely okay. believe that. And that's what Canada is doing. 72 nations and the state of California, New York, they have prices on carbon. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, John McCain pro proposed a cap and trade for America. So this is, this is trickled in, but then it goes away. And I mean, I really call on President Biden to be... To do, to do to more To do this, this, to do more, be bold. Then, I mean, I, I'm talking about boldness. I mean, one of the concerns, you know, for example, if the infrastructure goes ahead, the plan, there's no difference between blue hydrogen or brown hydrogen. Like, why are we not aggressive enough in the U.S. about what can be achieved and actually, you know, in, in defining what's acceptable and not in 2021? Well, I, I think part of it is the cost, because for blue hydrogen or green hydrogen to remove, well, for, for blue hydrogen to remove the hydrocarbons costs a lot, and green hydrogen takes a ton of energy. So they're both too expensive, which is why if, if fossil fuels actually paid what they cost to the planet, then you could have an alternative that is clean. And I'm more convinced than ever that a price on carbon is the only way yeah. to, to go if we're really serious. If we're happy with 2.4 and we kind of want to wing it yeah. and see what happens, I mean, two point, don't two, two point four is not good enough. If, any, if there's anything below two degrees, would that be acceptable? Is it something that you think would put us at least on a better path than we are now? I mean, I think the science says, and Paris did say below two, we picked that, up 1.5. And I loved the British slogan, one point, keep 1.5 alive. I thought that was great. But uh, I don't think Glasgow achieved that. But I do feel like the, the even without a price on carbon, mm -hmm. which is the big solution, mm -hmm. there's enough... Uh, pressure on companies to do something right. that that we're gonna we're gonna be better off. Okay, but Let, I don't know how much better. I'm always the optimist. Thank you so much, Lady Lynn Forrester, the Rothschild founding and managing partner, of course, and Inclusive Capital Partners. Now we'll have plenty more coming up from Singapore and from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. We'll hear from our conversation with David Solomon. We'll also be speaking to Pimco's John Stadinsky. The conversation here, of course, on U.S.-China relations. We had a good conversation, a robust conversation with David Solomon, uh, also discussing whether he had any pressure from Wall Street or from Washington, uh, pressuring Wall Street not to become bigger in China. He says no. So we'll discuss that. We'll see what he's expecting as possible big shocks ahead for the markets. This is Bloomberg. everyone and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Singapore for the Bloomberg New Economy Forum with some great market guests. So we'll talk to, of course, some market participants. We'll talk about inflation shortly. Now to the markets and European equities. A little bit mixed this morning. UK inflation actually rising to the highest level in a decade. That's after US equities bolstered by robust economic data, which may pressure the US central bank into action. Now we also heard from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis President James Bullard uh, saying that the central bank should speed up its reduction of monetary stimulus. The inflation rate is quite high. The core PCE inflation rate, the committee's favorite measure, is about 3.6 percent. That's the highest it's been in 30 years. So I think uh, it behooves the committee to tack in a more hawk hawkish direction. We could move faster. We kept optionality on this, that uh, uh, we could speed up the taper if it's appropriate. <laughs> Well, I'm very pleased to be joined here in Singapore by the vice chairman. And, of course, he's much more than the vice chairman. He's also managing director of PIMCO, John Studinsky. What a treat, John Studinsky. I shop in Singapore. We both live in London, but I get to speak to you here, not in London. So thank you so much for coming on. Well, here we are in the Garden of Eden. There you go. A good conversation on inflation. Are we underestimating the, the potency of inflation to, to be sticky and remain for longer? Well, we're no longer using the word transitory, but I think we've, that's been put to rest, I think, in the last couple of days. Um, 
Inflation's going to be re elevated, remain elevated for the foreseeable future. How long that is? We don't know, but, you know, it could be a couple of years. I know, but this is a nightmare for central banks. So if it's not transitory, at some point they were trying to figure out, you know, transitory could mean actually six months, eight months, even a little bit longer. Do you think they'll have to act sooner than they want to? Um, well, certainly there are at least 10 or 12 central banks around the world that probably are watching this much more closely. Um, if you look at the Fed's nuances from their last minutes, it probably suggests that they're going to raise rates certainly twice in... 2022, but maybe, maybe it'll be earlier. I mean, there are some people talking about higher inflation than what we've seen in the last quarter and the next quarter in the United States, so we'll have to wait and see. You saw the inflation data coming out earlier today for the UK. Blow out. I think that probably means that's going to rattle Andrew Bailey's cage a bit at the Bank of England, and maybe he's going to have to uh, look again in December about about the rate decision. I mean, what, what does it mean for fixed income in general? Are we going to see a big repricing, or uh, has a lot of this stuff already been priced in, especially after, you know, the Bank of England disappointed a lot of the markets last month? I think markets have a lot, pretty much priced in a lot of these. I think it, what's really going to be interesting is to see, you know, where th this is uncharted waters. We've got a lot of things, Francine, and you're hearing this discussion at this conference about the whole question of inflation and the variables affecting inflation. We're talking about a lot of investment in green. We're talking about deglobalization. We're talking about supply chains with China being disrupted uh, and how that affects prices elsewhere in the world. And, of course, we look out the window here in Singapore and we see a lot of ships in the harbor. Very fewer queuing there than in Los Angeles or in Shanghai, but it's a big issue. Do you still expect a lot of these, you know, energy shocks to go elsewhere? So these supply chain issues to remain for us, with us for longer. And what does that mean for, for the economy going forward? Well, you've got an overlay now on energy shocks, certainly in Europe. Um, you have Mr. Putin and uh, the whole issue with, with Poland and Belarus. And he's going to use his, his, uh, his role as um, sort of the key czar of Europe's energy security to play, a, you know, he, he's going to, he has a big seat at the table, and that's going to affect a lot of uncertainty on energy pricing, certainly in, in Europe. What do you worry about the most, John? I know you speak to, you know, all chief executives, many people from many walks of life. You're also an expert on China. Are we misreading the U.S.-China tensions and how they could develop going forward? I think the most important thing about the dynamic on China is, um, America has a strong view about China, and there's a strong domestic voice about issues it has with China. China has a view about America, and there's a strong Chinese voice in America, uh, in China about America. Um, I think they need to both take a little more time to better understand each other. There's, there's some disconnects right now. I think Biden is trying to engage more, but there's still some disconnects. Where are the main disconnects and actually what can be done? So if, if you have a disconnect at the government level, does it still mean that companies work with each other on a corporate level? So on a private level between U.S. and China, for example, on green technology and, and things like that? Well, China has been very much ahead of the curve, uh, as we all know, on green technology. I mean, 77 percent of what are the world's batteries, particularly relating to green applications, are manufactured in China. So I think there's probably, if I had to wave my arms and say, what would I really like to see? I'd like to see more integration between Chinese and American manufacturers relating to solving green energy problems. Because each one of them has certain segments of products and services. If they were more integrated and more collaborative, I think you would accelerate the way that some of these solutions were actually achieved. And I think that's, we're beginning to see that dialogue here. Mm. I think you're going to see more of that in the next 6 to 12 months. So this is not like a supremacy, this is not a battle for ultimate supremacy that we're seeing between the two countries. Well, I think there, there's a lot, you know, we, we talk about the Industrial Revolution and what happened in, in Europe and America in the Industrial Revolution. 1% um, inspiration, 99% perspiration. The Green Revolution is going to take decades to really come into full swing. Um, I think we've been spoiled by the fact that COVID being the first uh, sustainability shock, we had a vaccine in 12 to 15 months, we had, and we had a number of vaccines. We now think that we're going to come up with really credible technologies efficiently, uh, expeditiously for climate. We are, but it's going to take years. 
and we just have to pace this over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And, and the transition from brown to green is serious, but it has to be done as a transition and not absolutely cutting off one and embracing the other, particularly if the second one isn't really well developed. Uh, what are you most concerned about that we're underestimating? So I don't, you know, we talk about inflation, we talk about the energy costs, we talk about geopolitics. And I know it's very difficult to, to predict a black swan event, but what's on your mind that we should talk a lot more about? I think we probably are underplaying the role that the digital revolution is going to have on human behavior. And whether it's artificial intelligence in medicine, whether it's decision making in, uh, in the investment field, um, how that's going to have an impact on uh, the world. I think it's artificial intelligence, virtual reality, it's going to change a lot in the next two to three years, probably more than we realize. And it's also going to have a big act, impact on education. John, thank you so much, as always, for a little bit of your time. John Studinsky, there, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of PIMCO, joining us from Singapore at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Now, coming up in the next four days, well, in the next four days, we understand, Joe Biden will confirm the next Fed chair between incumbent Jay Powell and Leo Brainard. Up next, we're joined by economist Randy Krosner. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Singapore. Now, we talk about the markets, we talk about the Fed, we understand Joe Biden will announce his Fed chair nominee in the next four days. The top job will go to either current chair, Jay Powell, or Fed Governor Lyle Brainard. While Senate Banking Committee Chairman Sherrod Brown said he has no doubt that the Senate would confirm either candidate. Now, the first step in the confirmation process would be actually approval from the Banking Committee. So joining us now to talk about all of this is Randy Krosner. No one knows the institution better. He's a former Federal Reserve Governor and Deputy Dean for Executive Programs at the Booth School of Business, University of Chicago, based in London. Randy, always a pleasure. I can't believe we're so far apart. Always a pleasure to speak to you. First of all, does it really matter to the markets, Lael Brainard or Jay Powell? How much would they differ in terms of dovishness? I think in terms of monetary policy, there's a lot of similarity between them. I think they've been pretty much aligned Probably Lael would be a little bit slower to, to raise rates, um, but only um, a slight difference. I think they'd be very similar in terms of policy. So, Renu, how, do you, how are you thinking uh, of this, actually? I don't know whether, you know, it's almost a, a given that uh, President Biden will choose a Democrat. Why would he not? Why would he not choose a woman? Or do you think it's all to play? Well, uh, it's very clear that uh, Janet Yellen, who I think is a very important voice in, uh, in this decision, is very supportive of, of Jay. Um, they work very closely together. I think um, Jay is really pursuing the same kinds of policies that, uh, that Janet had, uh, had pursued. So I think it's, it's a real debate um, uh, within the administration. Should they go for Lael or should they go for, uh, for Jay? It's not really in terms of policy because they're very similar in policy, at least for monetary policy. Some of the other areas, like crypto and, and regulation, there are some big differences. Yeah. yeah so, so what do you? So let's say we have Lael Brainard actually as a new Fed chair. What will she most make a difference in? So crypto, but also maybe banking. Yeah. So I think it's it's very clear that she has a different view than uh, than Jay and Randy Quarles, the current vice chair for uh, for regulation of uh, banking and financial regulation. She dissented. I think more than 20 times on a variety of, uh, uh, of the, the, the votes that the Federal Reserve Board had on, on regulation, uh, always wanting to preserve tougher regulation. So my guess is she'd be tougher on, uh, on, on banks than, uh, than they, uh, they have. Not that they have been light on banks, but I think she'd want to go, she'd want to be more aggressive. Also, I think there's a big difference on uh, crypto. Jay has said he's still trying to decide which way he wants to go. Layla said, Full steam ahead. We've got to have a central bank digital currency now. Randy, when it comes to banking regulation, what kind of support would actually, you know, a possible chair, chair Brainard get? And, you know, what do you think would be the easiest thing to change if she were to take over? Well, I think one of the things that uh, she has been vocal about in the past and the Fed did not do uh, were these so-called countercyclical capital 
requirements. So that during good times, like you know, as the economy is coming back uh, fairly strongly now, to get banks to to hold a little bit more uh, more capital, so that uh, if times turn uh, turn not so good, uh, you can draw on that. And uh, that was something that she had uh, pushed for. Uh, the uh, the Fed didn't do it, and I think that's something that probably would happen uh, if she were either the vice chair for, uh, for regulation or certainly the chair. Randy, what's your take on inflation? Inf inflation, you know, doesn't look like it's transitory, but it could be with us only for about <laughs> 12 to 18 months. Is that transitory? Are, are you know, are central banks fine to wait? Are they doing the right call? We're starting to split hairs over exactly what transitory means versus other sorts of things. So I think we do need to put uh, transitory into the dustbin of history, although they, they kept it in the statement. I thought surely they would, uh, would move beyond that. Um, transitory is, uh, I, mean, I think short term is better um, because I think we're looking at at least six months to a year of much higher, uh, much higher rates. And uh, part of that is a bounce back from uh, the, the depths of, of lockdown a little bit more than a year ago. Part of it is just pent up demand coming in and interacting with the uh, uh, with the supply chain uh, supply chain issues. Uh, but the key question is: Will this short term issue turn into a longer term issue? Will inflation expectations start to move up? And that's yeah. a big question mark because we don't really understand the in inflation expectations process that well. Yeah, wh why don't we? I was going to ask you, why is it so difficult actually to read inflation? We have, you know, we should have the brightest minds and the brightest economists to tell us, or at least model something that could come close to what we should be seeing. Well, we, I think we certainly do. But the question is, if you don't have the data, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it's very hard to understand exactly uh, what's going to happen. And so we haven't been in a position like this before. Remember, we've had very low inflation for more than two decades, really no threat of, of high inflation. And the Fed has been undershooting its 2% target ever since it uh, articulated it almost, uh, almost a decade ago. Now we're uh, you know, 4%, 5% uh, inflation. This is happening not only in the U.S., but, uh, but globally. And we haven't done enough in terms of research to really look at the behavioral aspects. What do people think about inflation? How much are they paying attention to the Fed's new framework? Um, what causes them to unanchor their expectations or anchor their expectations? I mean, you're in, uh, in Asia right now. We have, you know, a lot of questions about what happened to Japan. Why can't Japan get to 2%? Inflation expectations have stayed low despite incredible work by, uh, by Kurodasan uh, as the head of the central bank, you know, building the central bank's um, balance sheet to more than 100% of GDP and still going further. And they haven't been able to be successful. We need to do more research on that. Sir, yeah, we do. Randy, what's the biggest policy mistake right now, given the parameters that we have at our disposal, which, as you say, we, we need to study a couple of things more. But is it a mistake to, you know, take it slow? Or would a mistake be to have to raise rates now and then take them back down in 18 months? Well, I, I, I'm, I think sort of some sort of shock now would not be, uh, would not make sense, because we still have a lot of uncertainty about the virus. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen this winter. Hopefully, uh, we will not see a resurgence of, of, of the virus, but there's still uncertainty around that. So I wouldn't want to go too quickly to claim that you know we have complete victory over the uh, over the virus. That hopefully will come by early next year, and then I think we can start to move a little bit more expeditiously. But even though uh, you know a supply chain um, shocks are outside of the Fed's uh, Fed's remit, uh, they can't do anything about uh, producing more chips. But they need to be mindful that the supply chain shocks that are causing prices to go higher could change expectations. So I think they may need to move a little more rapidly um, starting in the end of the first quarter of next year. Randy, thank you so much. Randy Krosner, their former Federal Reserve Governor and Deputy Dean, of course, uh, in London at the Booth School of Business, University of Chicago. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, from Singapore and from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. Coming up, we hear more from my panel with Goldman Sachs Chief Executive David Solomon. That's coming up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. I think that we're turning the economic environment back on, but because of this crisis, 
we've had a massive amount of monetary and fiscal policy all over the world that's, that's having an impact. It's having an impact on asset prices. It's having an impact on inflation, as, um, as you mentioned. Uh, I think markets generally, um, when I step back and I think about my 40-year career, there have been periods of time when greed has far outpaced fear. We were in one of those periods of time. And generally speaking, my experience says that you know, those periods are, are not long-lived. Um, something will rebalance it and bring a little bit more perspective. Certainly, given that it feels like inflation is rubbing above trend, chances are interest rates will move up. And if interest rates move up, that in and of itself will take some of the exuberance out of certain markets. But are you expecting some kind of taper tantrum from the markets? I, you know, I, I'm not a good predictor. <laughs> um, I, I've never thought of myself as a good predictor, but I, I, certainly, I certainly feel like the market anticipates higher rates. Um, at this point in time. The question is how much, how quickly. I, I don't think there's a chance that central banks can unwind this massive yeah. stimulus in a way that doesn't create some sort of a taper tantrum or some sort of a you know, real shock to markets. But there's also a chance it can't be done that way. And you know, I, I do think that people, you know, it's been a long time since we operated in an environment where the general trend on interest rates has been higher, and the general trend on inflation has been above trend. I got out of school in the early 1980s, and generally we've had the opposite you know, for that 35 plus, plus years. And so you know, I, I do think people don't remember when Paul Volcker raised interest rates by 300 basis points on a Sunday afternoon. So there are a lot of factors that will go into you know, how this process plays out. It's unclear. But I certainly think that, that thoughtful market participants are thinking about it. In my conversations with big institutions, they're thinking about it and they're trying to balance the need to participate and have relative performance based on participation um, and what happens as we unwind some of this and we rebalance a little bit. So are, are you telling me that you're worried that you know, markets are too cool about it just because they've made money for the last 10 years? Well, I, 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 I do think that you know, generally speaking, um, everyone feels quite smart right now because most of the things that you invest in are going up. Um, that's not the way it normally works. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not a great predictor, but my experience tells me this is a moment in time um, that's probably not a sustainable moment in time. But, but then it would be what, an economic shock? So away from an inflation monetary policy, it, it, could, what it, could it be? It could be a change in the perspective of the course of economic activity. Um, it could be some sort of a geopolitical shock. It could be that something goes wrong with respect to our emergence from the pandemic, and we have a different set of events that change the perspective. But all of this is based on kind of confidence and a forward view. And you know, I would say at the moment, the forward view is quite optimistic. Um, if it stays optimistic and central bankers you know, handle the withdrawal in an appropriate way with the right communication, there's a chance we can do it you know, in a balanced way. There's a chance something could go wrong. Got to be prepared for both. Uh, how do you prepare, actually, for both? Well, you, you prepare by you know, thinking about if the world worked differently, you know, how would it affect different assets, and um, you know, how, would you, how would you feel if, 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 if things were worth less? Yeah. Worth, not worthless, but worth, worth less. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so in, um, so in that context, you know, we, do, we do a lot of, we talk to our clients a lot about different scenarios, and you know, we think a lot about our own balance sheet and you know, our own propensity for risk um, as we try to navigate those things. Talk to me a little bit about China. So you, you're optimistic longer term in China. Do you ever get any pressure from Washington to grow less fast in China? We are um, we're very committed to building our business in China, but in the context of the fact that Goldman Sachs operates you know, globally all over the world and we serve governments and institutions uh, and corporations all over the world, and given the importance that China, the important position that China plays economically in the world, you really can't be Goldman Sachs without, without participating in that. I, I, I wouldn't say there's direct pressure on us to change our long-term plans to grow our business in China. Uh, is it possible at some point in time something goes on geopolitically between the US and China? And because we're a US company, there's either pressure or directive for us to do certain things differently. Sure, there's a possibility. Uh, but we think about this with a 10, 20, 30-year perspective, not with a you know, next couple of year perspective. And so we're long-term committed uh, to continuing to serve our clients by having the resources and the capabilities in China that allow our clients globally 
you know, to participate in markets. Well, that was Goldman Sachs Chief Executive David Solomon speaking to me a little bit earlier here at the New Economy Forum. We went also on to talk about the license, his license in China and some of the pitfalls out there. Now, stay tuned to Singapore. We'll have more interviews tomorrow, including our guests, the Chief Executives of HSBC Buyer and Moy Hennessy. It's interesting to have all of these different players and newsmakers from all walks of life to really try and understand some of the supply chain issues, some of the energy shocks, how they affect their business. Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition continues continues in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. I think what the data are telling us is that after the Delta variant setback, the economy is getting back on track. I think there are a lot of uncertainties across different axes of the market debate. The market's underestimating the extent of fiscal drag that's, that we're going to face next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, November the 17th. Our top stories today. Who will be the next chair of the Federal Reserve? President Biden narrows the field to just two contenders and says we'll learn his choice in a few days. The Bloomberg New Economy Forum kicks off in Singapore with some of the biggest names in finance and politics. There's one overarching question. What does a workable relationship between the U.S. and China really look like? And pressure builds on the Bank of England. Inflation in the UK rose faster than expected to the highest level in a decade. Investors wait to see if the central bank raises interest rates. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie here in London. Matt Miller with us in New York. Kayleigh Lines is off this week. And Matt, uh, we have a few days then perhaps to wait to hear who's going to lead the Fed. In the meantime, plenty of big voices in finance talking to us from Singapore through the Asia session. That's right. And on Bloomberg Television yesterday, we had the most most dovish and the most hawkish members of the Fed talking to us, Neil Kashkari and Jim Bullard. So we got kind of bookends there. Let's take a look at what's going on in Asia. Speaking of Singapore, we have the MSCI Asia Pacific index down half a percent right now. There are real concerns about exports in a second. I'm going to show you something out of Japan, but uh, here is the benchmark uh, in Tokyo. The Nikkei 225 down four tenths of one percent. Um, the Kospi moving down even further. I noticed real volatility over the past couple of days in the Kospi. So big moves away from um, its, uh, uh, its average over the past 30 days over the last three or four trading sessions. Here's the um, U.S. dollar Japanese yen. Little changed right now, but as you can see, we're getting closer and closer to 115. So this is, I think, a four-year uh, low here for the yen, and it could get even cheaper. That's not bad news for the Japanese. If you look at the exports out of Japan, they have drastically slowed, <laughs> or at least export growth has drastically slowed. And this is one of the issues that's been weighing on Asian stocks. They have real supply constraints, and that is holding back the amount of stuff they can sell. Actually, in that case, maybe a cheaper currency doesn't even really help because the problem is actually getting it made and on a boat and out of the port. By the way, take a look at U.S. Uh, stocks right now, or at least um, U.S. futures also down, but really little changed on, uh, uh, well, not having those concerns. The concerns for the U.S. market would be rising interest rates because of rising inflation. Um, a lot of people were listening to James Bullard yesterday, but of course he is the most hawkish member uh, of the Fed, so that's obviously going to be his point. The U.S. 10-year yield right now down a little bit as investors buy that debt, 163.19. So we've seen it rise uh, really uh, substantially over the past few sessions. Speaking of substantial gains, gold right now up half a percent, and it's really on a march to 1900, 1859 a troy ounce. Bitcoin going the other direction, down at 59,062. Tom, what are you saying? Yeah, Matt, of course, we've referenced the red hot debate around inflation in the US. We have inflationary data out of Europe as well for the Eurozone. So harmonized October data month on month. It was in line with the estimates. 0.8 percent was the increase year on year, just slightly softer. 2 percent versus 2.1 percent. We know that Christine Lagarde of the ECB has suggested there is no chance of a rate hike next year, 2022. But the 
when you unpack this data, the questions will be, of course, to what extent energy prices will remain elevated and whether that sustains these prices going forward towards the end of the year and then into 2022. Let's check in on how the markets are digesting this. We had inflation data out of the UK as well at a 10-year high, 4.2%, well above the estimates. It is putting into play very much now the idea that the Bank of England will raise rates in December. There's the consensus conforming around that view now. In the FTSE 100, seeing losses of close to four tenths of a percent. It's flat in France on the Cat Gahant, gains of two tenths of a percent, close to two tenths on the DAX over in Germany. And the FTSE mid in Italy is up by close to two tenths of a percent as well. Losses over in Spain of two tenths. So a divergent picture across the map here in Europe as investors weigh up this inflationary data. Let's have a look at some of the cross assets that you're talking about. Gold, again, heading towards that 1900 level, as you mentioned, Matt. There is that support for the yellow metal. That is a view from some gains of five tenths of a percent, as you noted. Across the benchmark, gains of a tenth of a percent continue to build on these record highs in Europe. The pound is in focus on the back of the inflationary data. It popped earlier in the session. It's currently a little softer at 134 and crude as well lower below $80 a barrel on reports that maybe you're going to get a coordinated effort between the US and China on releasing reserves pressure uh, in the oil space down 1%. Let me talk to you about infl another inflation theme or fights against inflation, what you do and don't do in that situation then, Tom. But with the uh, Turkish situation in mind, because we're getting some lines just in the last few minutes from the Turkish uh, 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 President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. So he's vowing to fight against interest rates. He says he won't uh, allow people, Turkish people, to be crushed under interest rates. Uh, I guess you might file this under things you already knew as well, because we have known for some time that the Turkish president has not been a fan of, fighting, uh, fight, uh, uh, of using interest rates to fight inflation and hence we've seen uh, a substantial movement in recent years on the Turkish currency. It is currently 10.4 to the dollar just five years or so ago. I think it was around three. So uh, a substantial movement in recent years. Now let's take a look at some of the other things we're watching out for today. The EU will unveil its strategy for more than 46 billion euros in technology and infrastructure spending. This is a key part of the West's response to China's Belt and Road program. Follows on from, of course, that meeting between uh, the U.S. US and Chinese leadership. The SEC chair Gary Gensler and Fed presidents from New York and San Francisco will speak at the US Treasury Market Annual Conference. I wonder if crypto will get a mention. It's certainly been mentioned in Singapore at our conference there. Now the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson faces a grilling from the Commons Liaison Committee, a senior panel of all uh, of, of, of all the select committee chairs, so essentially some fairly powerful people from different parties across Westminster and the recent scandals in the UK around the behaviour of MPs will be in focus and we will get more from US data including housing starts and MBA mortgage applications of course it was Matt some strong data that allowed further risk rallies in the US yesterday that retail sales number better than had been expected yeah absolutely Americans seem to be flush with cash and are spending it when they can find stuff to buy now President Biden is still deciding whether to reappoint Fed Chair Jerome Powell or replace him with Fed Governor Lyle Brainerd. The president says um, to expect an announcement within about four days. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard told Bloomberg yesterday he expects continuity amid the leadership reshuffle. No matter how this comes out, there'd be a lot of continuity in Fed policy. Uh, both of these uh, players have... Uh, you know, long track records uh, at the Fed. Uh, so certainly uh, it's a big committee. Also, I think uh, people have to keep that in mind. Uh, and, and there's a lot of experience on the committee. So I think we'd see uh, continuity. Anne-Marie Hordern joins us from Washington, D.C. And Anne-Marie, I guess, you know, depending on your perspective, four days is about as imminent as four hours, right? <laughs> yeah, we went from imminent to a bit of indecisiveness from the White House, given the fact that the president has yet to even make a decision. But we do know that it is between these two contenders. It is certainly going to be either a reappointment of current chair Jay Powell or Governor Brainard is going to get um, a more elevated position at the Fed. And what we do know is that there are also some senators now looking to have some meetings with these two individuals, especially with uh, the current chair, Jay Powell. He'll be meeting with Senator Joe Manchin. Remember, this is the senator who in August sent the chair a letter talking about his concerns of higher inflation. And really, monetary policy, There, everyone says there's going to be this continuation regardless of who 
gets mm. this top spot. But whoever does get it, that is going to be the issue they have to deal with, and that's going to be inflation. That has made this decision a little bit more dramatic, those October CPI numbers. Yeah, absolutely, Anne-Marie. It's interesting to think about what uh, what difference who leads the Fed would make, but then also what political messaging might be behind the decision as to who leads the Fed. And what are you hearing about the way that uh, the White House is weighing up the, the, the politics of this? Because inflation, not just a monetary policy issue right now, but really at the front and centre for, politi for politicians. Well, neither Chair Powell or Governor Brainerd have been in their roles where they've had to deal with high inflation. Governor Brainard has been in the role from 2014, and we've had inflation average 1.4%, nothing with a 6% handle. So we don't really know how either of them will really con has spoken about inflation because they haven't dealt with it. When you look at the politics behind it, though, she clearly has a little bit more of support with the progressives in the party. Senator Elizabeth Warren has not come out and supported her outright, but he, she has called Jerome Powell a dangerous man. There's also Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, who, if it was going to be Jay Powell, he wants to hear him take a little bit more of a tougher stance on climate change. There are issues that they diverge a little bit on, and this could be banking regulation, climate change, cryptocurrencies, whether or not there's going to be a central bank crypto. But when it comes to monetary policy, these two individuals are in lockstep. OK, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hodan, thank you very much indeed in Washington on the politics of that Fed leadership decision. OK, now to Singapore, where the fourth annual Bloomberg New Economy Forum is underway. China's growing role on the world stage. Climate change and economic questions from inflation to cryptocurrencies have been the focus. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix has spoken to a variety of guests on supply chains. We need to think about resilience, we need to think about inventory. Right now, every CFO in the world is out selling their suppliers. You need to have more inventory. The underlying trend, pre-pandemic and certainly to accelerate, is that the principal powers in the system, the United States, the European Union, and China, really do want to nationalize supply chains, do nearshoring, industrial policy. All the indications uh, we have is that it will flow right through into beyond the middle of next year. Uh, we're a nation way down in, in the Pacific. We rely on supply chains for everything that we bring in and anything we sell. Um, there's no easy option for us. For so long in our supply chain, the mantra has been just in time. And now we realize the vulnerabilities of just in time. We need to move to just in case. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix is on the ground at the event for us in Singapore. So some voices there on the needs to shore up the supply chain. Hi, Francine. What else has, has really stood out to you from the conversations uh, that you've had with corporate and world leaders uh, just in the first stages of this conference? Yeah, I have to say, Dom, first of all, it's a lot about jet lag. I mean, a lot of these executives, it's the first time they travel in about two years. I just had this conversation with the Goldman Sachs chief executive. He says he hasn't been in Asia since early 2020, and so he was excited to be here. He did tell me that he wasn't going to be in Hong Kong uh, like Jamie Dimon was, just because of the quarantine rules. But, you know, a lot of people, it's the first time that they've been here in the country for a long time, in the region for a time, and it's a time for them to talk to each other. So the focus is definitely on inflation. I hear a lot of inflation. What does it mean for your business? Mm. What does it mean if interest rates rise on financing and, of course, supply chain? But the bigger question is also China, China's role in the world, China's role in climate change, and, of course, Matt, you know, China's role in uh, some of these supply chains, especially if they continue with the zero COVID policy. And, well, uh, speaking of chains, and you mentioned Jamie Dimon, I wonder what you're hearing about crypto, because, you know, we, we saw this incredible rally in Bitcoin to almost $70,000, and now it's back down with a 50 handle. Yeah, I mean, so if you speak to a lot of the big banking executives, uh, you know, a bit more mainstream than maybe some of the cooler AI guys, for the moment they say, look, crypto is not something I want to be invested in for my bank. We know, though, Matt, that, of course, they're still looking at ways to not disappointing um, some of their clients that want to be exposed to it. And then you speak to, uh, you know, the, the younger guys that have come here and actually want to push crypto forward, and they're worried about regulation. So I think it's all about regulation in the next couple of weeks of months. That's what the talk is here. And then, of course, market correction. I asked that to David Solomon. I said, look, 
given we haven't been able to lose money in the last 10 years, what does it mean when we have a price readjustment because of monetary policy? And he laughed and says it's true that in his career he's seen moments of greed, usually followed by some kind of setback. And in the moment, he calls it a moment of greed just because it was very difficult to lose money or not very easy to make money is the way he put it. I put it the other way, Anna. Francine, thank you very much. Francine Lacroix in Singapore. Our coverage of Bloomberg's new economy forum, of course, continues. And we'll be speaking to the Prime Minister of Singapore at around 7 a.m. New York time. Now, here in the UK, inflation has surged to the highest in a decade. This puts increased pressure on the Bank of England to raise interest rates. Let's get more uh, with Bloomberg's UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden. And Lizzie, uh, the Bank of England then, looking at this data, there'd been a lot of expectation that we were going to see a hike in November. The market was wrong-footed there. Now all of that expectation heaped on, sept on December. Yeah, markets are going to be asking what more the Bank of England needs to persuade it to hike in December. Inflation at CPI came in at 4.2%, so that's above economists' expectations. It's also the third month that it's above the Bank of England's 2% target. It's a 10-year high in the UK, and it's expected to keep on rising. Already this week, we've heard from the Governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, saying he's very uneasy about this inflation picture in the UK. He said the reason he didn't vote to hike in November was because he wanted to see how the jobs market's doing. Well, the labour market data that we got yesterday added to the picture to this argument for a December rate hike. Uh, and so the question now is whether fears about inflation will mean that price growth starts fueling itself. Uh, Lizzie, we saw that jump in gas prices again yesterday on the back of the news around Nord Stream 2 and the hold-up in terms of certification for that. How central are those energy prices to what's driving up inflation more broadly across the UK? Very. You had a bigger than expected rise in hotel and restaurant costs, but it all really comes back to energy. Wholesale uh, uh, natural gas and electricity prices uh, rose last month after the regulator allowed suppliers to hike tariffs uh, because of offsetting these wholesale costs. That's expected to happen again in April at the same time as a planned tax rise. So unless the Bank of England steps in soon, this squeeze on household incomes could undermine the recovery. All right, Lizzie, thanks very much. Lizzie Burden there, Bloomberg's UK economy reporter. Let's take a look now at some of the stocks moving in the pre-market here in the United States of America. Lucid Group is rising, and Lucid is now worth more than Ford and GM. This incredible EV rally that seems to have been sparked by the Rivian IPO has really made Lucid a leader. Every day when I look at the pre-market movers, most space U4 is the way I do that. Lucid seems to be right up at the top this week. Um, so now it continues to gain 7% in the pre-market. Visa, on the other hand, is going down. The payments network getting hit um, pretty hard by an announcement uh, from Amazon. They will no longer be accepting UK-issued Visa credit cards. In fact, they told consumers in the UK that they would get a 20-pound uh, gift receipt or 20-pound uh, gift certificate if they would switch to any other kind of card, including a Visa debit card. And then what I really think is interesting is Qualcomm. They had an investment day yesterday, investor day yesterday. They were very bullish, um, saying they could reach $46 billion in sales by 2024. A huge piece of that is augmented reality goggles, I guess you would call them. Qualcomm says that business could become as big or bigger than the phone business, which I struggle to understand, but I'm getting a lot older. Maybe the kids love it, Anna. Maybe the kids love those goggles. Yes. Very meta, I'm sure. Now, coming up on this program, EC the ECB warns of market exuberance. We will speak to BlackRock's Elga Bach about that subject. That conversation coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Tom McKenzie in London, Matt Miller with us in New York. Kayleigh Lines is off this week. And Tom, I'm certainly watching gas prices this week. Just in yesterday's session, we saw European gas prices in the Eurozone and also in the UK jumping by 17%. Today, another day of moves to the upside, up by more than 6% on both of those measures. So we are seeing some moves to the upside. Given our concerns around inflation, that's certainly something we need to watch. On the flip side of the energy story then, oil prices, WTI, 
overnight now down more than 1.2% uh, is close to the losses you're seeing in today's session, below that $80 a barrel mm. for WTI. Uh, Brent is in similar territory as well. Reports that the US and China may be talking about some kind of coordinated effort to release reserves. We'll see what happens, but certainly pressure on the oil space. Okay, yeah, certainly pressure on the oil space. Uh, and uh, Matt, then, just as we approach the US session, what catches your eye, apart from the rise and rise of electric vehicles? Well, actually, uh, the rise in gold has caught my eye this morning for sure, but also the continued drop in Bitcoin. So we saw, you know, Bitcoin approaching $70,000 a piece, and um, now it's at $59,000, a drop of just about 10 grand in a couple of weeks, right now down 2.5%. We do see the 10 year yield creeping higher. Um, uh, right now it's coming down a little bit, but it has crept higher since 24 hours ago this time yesterday, 162.67 um, right now. S&P futures are doing a whole lot of nothing um, right now at 46.94. So we don't expect to see a lot of direction at the open, but you do see a little bit of a gain in Europe, the stock 600 right now. In terms of the pre-market movers, I've been talking about um, some of these stocks you mentioned the EVs, right? Lucid is now bigger than Ford and GM. It's up 6.5% in the pre-market at 59. And this has really been sparked by Rivian. So check out RIVN on your terminal if you want. When their IPO hit, it started driving Lucid up, LCID. The CEO, Peter Rollinson, said he thinks they will be able to produce 20,000 vehicles next year. And that was uh, in doubt, in jeopardy because of the chip and uh, uh, chip shortage and, and really the supply chain crunch. Visa down now one and a half percent. This is more of a UK specific issue, but Amazon says it won't accept Visa credit cards anymore because of the high fees. Now, this could be the beginning of a war between all credit card issuers and Amazon. They will give um, users who don't use a Visa credit card who enter a different form of payment a 20 pound gift certificate. So you may think about that, Anna and Tom. And then Qualcomm, right now it is down, but it jumped yesterday in the live trade after they gave a very bullish outlook and said they could reach $46 billion in sales in 2024, three and a half billion dollars in sales to the auto industry alone, and that AR, augmented reality goggles, could become a bigger business than the phone business for them. So really interesting stuff from Qualcomm, Anna. Yeah, host of movers then pre-market. Let's think about whether we're seeing exuberance in any of these markets then, Matt, because the ECB has issued a warning about just that, talking about pockets of exuberance. In its financial stability review, the central bank warned that stretched prices in the credit, asset and housing markets pose a threat to euro area stability. Elga Barch, BlackRock head of macro research, joins us now on set here in London. A real pleasure to see you on set this morning with us then, Elga. Uh, let me ask you, do you see pockets of exuberance? That's the wording that the ECB is using this morning. Do you see any of those pockets? At the uh, macro level, we don't see pockets of exuberance, no. Um, in fact, we remain pro-risk and uh, in particular like equities at this stage. If anything, a concern is the decline in liquidity in government bond markets. And with the difficult decisions that central banks are facing in the light of the spike in commodity prices, that's really where the concern is. And that would be an area, government bonds, that we would be underweight. That's an area you're underweight. But thinking about your equity experience, Exposure then, Elga. How does the inflation concern play into that? You think that actually with rising inflation, it's a good place to be in equities rather than uh, being in bonds? Or do, or do you have concerns that further down the track, the inflation numbers start to eat into the, the sort of economic recovery stories that we've seen globally? Um, not yet. Um, and in fact, we do like equities as a place to hide from inflation, so to speak. Um, not in the least because companies are still having a lot of uh, pricing power to pass on the cost pressures that they are facing. Um, and we do think that central banks, even though at some point they might react uh, to the rise in inflation expectations in particular, they will do so in a much more muted fashion than they have done in the past. And with real interest rates staying low, uh, risk assets are well supported.
how much risk do you want to be taking along that spectrum of risk assets within the equity space? Do you like small caps at this stage? How much discrimination do you have to impose on that decision, given the pressures that Anna's just been discussing? Yeah, so we have a differentiated approach, and mm. we do like to seek cyclical exposure where we think it's still attractive. One place would be Europe. Another place would be U.S. small caps. So there's definitely sort of some differentiation in the view. You're also positive on, on China. Uh, China, China equities, but also China credit. What, un what underscores that view given the list of concerns emanating out of mainland China? So the main um, uh, reason um, is really that a lot of the bad news on policy tightening along a number of different dimensions is now behind us and we're, that we are seeing already on the ground some signs of uh, an easing, especially in the property side. Mm. Matt? Yeah, I, I was wondering, we all sort of learn in Econ 101, that inflation that. is a uh, can be a tax, in a sense, on the poor. I do apologize. Food I think that uh, and oil maker. Elga, I, I think that, uh, I'm sorry, Matt, uh, I don't think that Elga can hear you. So I'll just, uh, I'll try and jump in with what I think you were about to ask. Matt was talking about how you learn in uh, Economics 101 about how the inflation, the burden of higher inflation falls on lower income groups. Is that something that you're expecting? Clearly, this is getting the attention of politicians in various parts of the world. Is this something that you're going to focus on, that's going to be a focus, do we think? Politicians getting involved in this inflation debate? Yeah, I think, so. I think it's starting to be a real political issue, especially in the US. But I do think that based on some preliminary academic work that I have seen, um, that um, it's not the usual type of inflation that primarily weighs on low-income households, and that has to do with the fact on where we see most of the price increases, which is in goods prices in particular, and to some extent in services. It's the energy and the food price inflation that gets everyone. Mm. Um, but again, these inflation pressures at the moment are driven by this very unusual restart, by the imbalances on the supply side of the economy, which we have expect to resolve over time uh, in the course of next year. And how does that translate into a European context then? You mentioned in the, in the United States. What about in Europe where maybe the inflation pressure is a, a little more muted, but would you still expect it to have that same impact on different sort of economic groups? Yes, yeah, so it is, uh, I think, similar uh, in terms of the drivers, but the magnitude is very different and the long-term or medium-term inflation outlook is different. The Federal Reserve expects after the current bout in inflation, uh, inflation to settle near its uh, uh, price stability objective. The ECB cannot say the same thing. Most likely inflation will ease back below 2% okay. and that means that the ECB's work isn't done I here. I think we found Matt's mic, so let's try again. Well, uh, hey, Alga, you know, as we all wait for the White House to confirm its choice, I wonder if you think someone like Lael Brainerd can do more to address these issues than Jerome Powell is right now because it seems like that's what they want they they want to find a more woke chair for senator warren at the end of the day we need to recognize that all central bank decisions are taken by committee and it makes um more of a difference of sort of in terms of communication who fronts the exercise but i do think that at the end of the day it's um, a decision that is very much driven by the composition of the committee and the views that a committee takes. And uh, therefore, um, we um, need to acknowledge that, particularly at the Federal Reserve, we have a large number of open mm. seats. And that means that we could potentially face quite a material change in uh, the FOMC's uh, views in coming months, uh, going well beyond uh, the appointment of the chair. What, what do you? Think, I mean, when you were uh, studying at Kiel in between sailing trips, what did you learn about fighting inflation? Or when you're um, operating as a member of the Shadow Council for the ECB, what do you think about fighting inflation in an age where it's caused by supply constraints? It seems so difficult to do with monetary policy. Indeed, and I do think that central banks are going to face uh, a much more difficult uh, period going forward, potentially for uh, an extended period of time, because over the last three decades, we had primarily demand uh, shocks that monetary policy is very well positioned to address. 
going forward, we might actually run into a larger number of supply side shocks, which monetary policy can do very little about and faces very unpleasant trade-offs. That's really where fiscal policy and other economic policies that help to unclog those bottlenecks are required. Elga, thank you very much. Thanks for spending time with us here on set in London. Elga Bash from BlackRock. Coming up on this programme, the CEO of Goldman Sachs says market greed is now outpacing fear. Part of our interview with David Solomon from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum in Singapore. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today from the New Economy Forum, HSBC's CEO Noel Quinn. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie alongside Anna Edwards here in London, Matt Miller in New York. OK, let's get back to Singapore then, where the fourth annual Bloomberg New Economy Forum has begun. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon warned about the potential rocky times ahead for markets as the economy recovers from the pandemic. Solomon spoke with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. I think that we're turning the economic environment back on, but because of this crisis, we've had a massive amount of monetary and fiscal policy all over the world that's, that's having an impact. It's having an impact on asset prices, it's having an impact on inflation, as, um, as you mentioned. Uh, I think markets generally, um, when I step back and I think about my 40-year career, there have been periods of time when greed has far outpaced fear. We were in one of those periods of time. And generally speaking, my experience says that, you know, those periods are, are not long lived. Um, something will rebalance it and bring a little bit more perspective. Certainly, given that it feels like inflation is rubbing above trend, chances are interest rates will move up. And if interest rates move up, that in and of itself will take some of the exuberance out of certain markets. But are you expecting some kind of taper tantrum from the markets? I, you know, I, I'm not a good predictor. <laughs> um, I, I've never thought of myself as a good predictor, but I... I certainly, I certainly feel like the market anticipates higher rates um, at this point in time. The question is how much, how quickly. I, I don't think there's a chance that central banks can unwind this massive yep. stimulus in a way that doesn't create some sort of a taper tantrum or some sort of a you know, real shock to markets. But there's also a chance it can't be done that way. And you know, I, I do think that people, you know, it's been a long time since we operated in an environment where the general trend on interest rates has been higher and the general trend on inflation has been above trend. I got out of school in the early 1980s and generally we've had the opposite, you know, for that 35 plus, plus years. And so, you know, I, I do think people don't remember when Paul Volcker raised interest rates by 300 basis points on a Sunday afternoon. So there are a lot of factors that will go into, you know, how this process plays out. It's unclear, but I certainly think that, that thoughtful market participants are thinking about it. In my conversations with big institutions, they're thinking about it and they're trying to balance the need to participate and have relative performance based on participation. Um, and what happens as we unwind some of this and we rebalance a little bit. So are, are you telling me that you're worried that, you know, markets are too cool about it just because they've made money for the last 10 years? Well, I, 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 I do think that, you know, generally speaking, um, everyone feels quite smart right now because most of the things that you invest in are going up. Um, that's not the way it normally works. <laughs> so, um, I, I, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not a great predictor, but my experience tells me this is a moment in time um, that's probably not a sustainable moment in time. But, but then it would be what, an economic shock? So away from an inflation monetary policy, it, it, could, what could it, it be? It could be a change in the perspective of the course of economic activity. Um, it could be some sort of a geopolitical shock. It could be that something goes wrong with respect to our emergence from the pandemic and we have a different set of events that change the perspective. But all of this is based on kind of confidence and a forward view. And, you know, I would say at the moment the forward view is quite optimistic. Um, if it stays optimistic and central bankers, you know, handle the withdrawal in an appropriate way with the right communication, yeah. there's a chance we can do it, you know, in a balanced way. 
there's a chance something could go wrong. Got to be prepared for both. <laughs> uh, how do you prepare, actually, for both? Well, you, you prepare by, you know, thinking about if the world looked differently, you know, how would it affect different assets and, um, you know, how would you, how would you feel if, 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 if things were worth less? Yeah. Worth, not worthless, but worth, worth less. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so in, um, so in that context, you know, we do, we do a lot of, we talk to our clients a lot about different scenarios and, you know, we think a lot about our own balance sheet and, you know, our own propensity for risk um, as we try to navigate those things. Really important conversation there. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix earlier at the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. And Matt, interesting to hear them talk about the way things might go right or might go wrong as we see central banks globally dealing with the removal of the amount of stimulus they put into markets at the height of the crisis and also talking about the need for long memories. And the more we can refer, we can talk to people with long memories who remember the, the 70s, the inflation spike there, the early 90s and the higher interest rate environment, we all learn something. Well, I I remember the early 90s quite well. Um, I was a little young in the 70s, but I think we've all read the history, and uh, I think a lot of people who focus on markets, whether they were there in the 70s or not, um, are, uh, are really well informed. Mm. Um, Paul Volcker uh, raising interest rates quickly in a short amount of time um, is really interesting to bring up because it does seem like um, many officials at the Fed and in, in other organizations usually err on the side of doing less than doing more. So they think they can get in less trouble if they do nothing uh, as opposed yeah. to doing more. And, of course, Tom, relationships between the U.S. and China are a really prominent topic at this forum, at the new economy forum taking place in Singapore. Yeah, and they reiterated, Goldman Sachs the CEO reiterated their commitment to China, but said, look, longer term, yeah, we may get pressure politically uh, from Washington or Beijing, but for the moment, they have to be committed to that market. Absolutely. We'll have plenty more interviews for you coming from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum throughout the week, including Bill Gates, the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Also tonight on Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations, David Rubenstein sits down with the SEC chair, Gary Gensler. That's at 9 p.m. in New York. I wonder if they will talk crypto. This is Bloomberg. Back. China cannot develop in isolation of the world, and nor can the world develop without China. I assume the Chinese leaders will work towards the maximum capability of their country. Our task as Americans and non-Chinese is to understand what we need to do to make sure that there is at least equivalence and in no case subordination. China needs to play by the rules. They need to uh, respect our IP. They need to live up to their commitments. You know, right now, for example, in the so-called phase one deal, where the Chinese committed to purchase a certain amount of, you know, aircraft and agricultural products, they're not doing that. They're not living up to their commitment. You have to be able to sit down and work through, especially your market access issues when it comes to goods. So we would need some sort of ministerial dialogue to be able to work through that market uh, accession. Clearly both um, major uh, trading partners of ours, Australia's number one, uh, China number two, um, we want them both to work together so that we don't get caught in the crossfire of tensions that, you know, still exist. Various guests there speaking on China tensions and trade at Bloomberg's new economy forum, which is taking place in Singapore. Tom Keen joins us now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. And Tom, I noticed um, very interesting takes there that are geographically divided. The closer you are to China, it seems you want to work with them. The further away you are from China, it's more a zero-sum game and it's sort of working against them. H how is this going to play out? Well, the way it's going to play out is the diplomacy that we see at the New Economy Forum back to the reality of domestic and international Chinese uh, politics. So those important communist uh, meetings they've got coming up, government meetings, Politburo meetings, over the next year, there's going to be a restructuring uh, in China. The backdrop for that, Matt, is GDP. Let's look at the output numbers. Leland Miller, who's the smartest guy in the block in this, tells me you look at the relative move 
not the actual level. In the broad span of 15 years is a move from 11 percent down to a 5 percent statistic on GDP with the gyrations of the pandemic in order. What's that trend? Well, there's a lot of people betting on a trend of uh, a lower GDP. I would suggest many, many equity strategists are betting big on a Pacific Rim recovery. Tom, it's remarkable, isn't it? 5% is the number that's being flagged then for 2022 amongst some houses. There was a time when below 7% was seen as a key line for the leadership in Beijing in terms of ensuring yeah. that stability. It's a time of common prosperity, of course. I talk to people on the ground in Beijing. They say they are taken by surprise, stunned by the changes okay. around technology okay. and real estate. Let me, let me how is this? Yeah, how, how, how are you making sense of this? Let me translate this so everybody understands. Yeah. When Tom McKenzie says he's talking to people on the ground, Matt and Anna, he's behind the red doors in Beijing talking to people about <laughs> what's going on in the government. I, you know, Tom, what's behind the red doors is what really matters yeah. to me. And they're looking again at the city-state structure. Let me ask you, Mr. McKenzie, because you're the smartest guy in this conversation. Does city-state still reign in China? Is the mayor of Shanghai the most powerful guy in the land? Not anymore. Not anymore. Not under this leadership. And yeah, that is the, the problem. Big change. When it yeah. comes to art, that is the big change. And that comes down to then how do you articulate this policy that's being constructed in Beijing at the local level? You can follow the leadership, but then you don't have the ability to adjust to local conditions, Tom. See, Anna, how I got a red uh, Bloomberg cup today. I mean, we're color coordinated on theme. It's just a great. I'm it's impressed. Thing. It's a match, matching Matt's tie. Oh, no, he's gone yellow. That, that no, didn't that's work. okay. So we, Matt and I got the flag going. It's great. Excellent. Yeah. Tom, Tom Keane, thank you very much. Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg. Why don't you Surveyors. talk to Mackenzie more about China? Let's do that. In fact, Tom has important things to say about what he's watching over in China very briefly right now. Just very briefly on real estate, of course. We've been watching Evergrande and the pressures in the credit sector. We've got reports now that China is going to be allowing some property developers okay. to issue asset-backed securities. That could alleviate some pressure. Okay, Anna. so we continue to watch real estate over in China. Matt's watching the German COVID cases still on the move to the upside. I'm watching the latest from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum. It continues in Singapore. This is Bloomberg.